Greetings, it is I, Tantus Nav and Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, where I go set by reset, product release by product release, giving you information about them, interesting cards you can find, allowing you to know a little bit more about the history of Magic, the various mechanics, and the various things that brought today to forth the modern version of Magic we play today. All right. Let's dive into the second set in the Lauren block, Morning Tide. Now, Morning Tide was released on February 1st of 2008 and had 150 cards. Now, its major themes, of course, continued those of Lorwyn with Tribal, and it had the keywords of Clash, returning from last time, and introduced Kinship, Prowl, and Reinforce. An interesting thing about this, that the Tribal themes that were here were based around not races, like it was in the previous set, but classes. We'll dive into that a little bit more in a minute. Now, the expansion symbol represented maybe a morning sun or perhaps even a burning fire. And this set here was considered the end of the Lauren block when it came to products. The next set, Shadow Mirror, was considered a new block that way. But when it came to tournaments, both this two sets here and the next two sets are considered a single block when it comes to tournaments. So that's an interesting thing here that these two set blocks are considered blocks for products, but for tournaments, all four are together. Now it was accompanied by a novel of the exact same name here. And it is important to note that this set introduced a new type of tribal card, tribal equipment. So the story, of course, continued along the way of the Celtic European style that had been established in the previous set. But we focus more on Riss in this set here. Riss is an elf that has recently been exiled from his people for two reasons, two problems. The first was a great cataclysm came upon his people and killed many of them and many other creatures, and he was put to blame for it. And the second, his horns broke. The fact is, the elven society here is based upon perfection. And with his broken horns, he is no longer perfect. So his people have begun to hunt him down. Dangers are around every turn. And of course, the Aurora is oncoming, which is something we will really dive into when it comes to the next set. So it's sold in 16 card booster packs, four pre-constructed decks, and a fat pack. The pre-constructed decks and the fat pack had a Pro Tour card in them. Now the pre-release was on January 19th to 20th of 2008, and accompanying it was a Door to Destinies pre-release card that was, of course, had alternate art. The release card was Earwig Squad with some alternate art, and it was released in conjunction to show off the Prowler mechanics and on a special release event, release party from the 1st of 3rd of February 2008. Now, just like the sets before, this set had a bonus 16th card. This took two forms. The first form, of course, was a rules card. There were five special rules cards released as part of this. The second took the form of tokens. There were, in fact, 14 tokens released as part of this set. Now, that seems like a lot, but the fact is, only three of these tokens, including Treefolk Shaman, were actually Morning Tide exclusives. The other 11 tokens, including this wolf token here, were from Lorwyn. Reprints from Lorwyn that were put in part of here because these type of tokens also showed up in this set. The big exception here, backing. There were six ads part of the Morning Tide black that these Lorwyn ones would have here rather than the ones that were released from the previous Lorwyn. So the set expanded the tribal themes of Lorwyn, of course. But this time, rather than focusing on the eight races, which we had described last time, which still were a major focus, we focused on five classes. A complete shift. Soldier, Shaman, Wizard, Warrior, and Rogue. Now there were some evolution of abilities. We had the Clash cards that returned to your hand. These were specialized Clash cards that once you finished the Clash, if you won the Clash, the clashing, the card which forced the clash returns to your hand. So I could play my clash card. If I win, I get it back. Another thing was we had a good theme of when a creature of a certain type would come into play, 
it would come into play with a plus one, plus one counter because of another card gave this ability or effects to that type. There was a bunch of these within the set that would effectively play them, and then other creatures of that type would get bigger. Another thing was cards that when you would play them, you would choose a type. And then, for every number of that type you had in play, you would have a effect. This was a little bit more universal, that you could have these within any of the basic tribal decks, and easily be able to get a big effect. But let's talk about the keywords that were introduced here, starting with Prowl. Prowl was particularly to rogues. That means if you had Prowl, you would definitely be a rogue. Other rogues might not have Prowl, but if you're going to have Prowl, you have to be a rogue. It was an alternate mana cost. If you would deal combat damage to an opponent with a creature that matches one of the types of the card with Prowl, you could then play the card with Prowl at its Prowl cost instead of its normal mana cost. So if I have a Prowl card, a rogue in this case, I deal damage with a rogue to my opponent, I can play my rogue now for that Prowl cost. And many Prowl cards had special abilities that would trigger if you would pay the Prowl cost. Kinship was for shamans. It was a particularly a shaman ability. At the beginning of your upkeep, you could look at the top card of your library. Now, if it had a creature type that matched one of the creature types of the kinship creature you just used this ability to, so if my kinship is a, let's say, tree folk shaman, and I revealed either, I looked at either a tree folk or a shaman at the top, I could reveal it, and then the kinship effect would trigger. So that's what effectively it would do, is I would trigger the kinship on my tree folk shaman. Reinforce was an activated ability, and it had the format of Reinforce N, a mana cost that would use to trigger it. What you'd do is you'd pay the reinforce cost, and then you'd discard the reinforce card from your hand. So this is an activated ability you're playing from your hand, discarding it. And then you would put a N, there's where that reinforce N comes in, plus one, plus one counters on a creature you control. So effectively, in a lot of these creatures that had plus one and plus one uh, counter abilities on them that were within this set, this was a good way of putting them on there. I could discard a reinforce card using this activated ability instead of its normal ability to put them on the creatures for their triggered effects, which might be bigger or better in this case. So there were 11 cycles in this set. The first was the Bannerets. The Bannerets would make two creature types cheaper to play by one colorless mana. Traditionally, this was a race and a class. So a race class combination, each one of them would now cost you one colorless mana less to play. There were the choose a type spells. These were a set of common spells that when you'd play them, you'd choose a creature type, and the effects of the spells were based upon the number of that creature type you controlled. There were of course a cycle of common changelings, just that, changelings that were common. A cycle of common elementals that had the unique thing that when they would come into play, they would come into play with a number of plus one, plus one counters on them, and each one of them had the ability that you would remove a plus one, plus one counter from them for an effect. There was also a group of common creatures with kinship. There were the lesser tribal lords. These were creatures that would give a bonus or an interaction with a specific type of creature type. In this case, it was a class different than the five classes I mentioned before. A lesser class that was less supported in this set, yet still saw a few creatures of this type within it. This way, it would give a big bonus to this lesser class that didn't get the same amount of bonuses, but this was a way of supporting them. There were the clashback spells. These were effectively those clash spells, uncommon ones, that if you would win the clash, you'd return it to your hand, the ones I mentioned before. There were the tribal counter lords. These were, of course, creatures that would be linked to, in, to a certain creature type when they would come into play. Mm. If you would have this lord in play, when another creature of the mentioned type comes into play, it comes into play with a plus one, plus one counter. So this lord gave that every other creature of the type that it mentioned would come into play. They would come into play bigger. There were the tribal equipment, which I mentioned before. These were linked to the five classes. Each one of them had a specific equipment that, of course, you play it, it have a effect, you have equip cost, but each of them had the unique ability that when I would put a creature of the same type into play, I could choose to attach this equipment 
to them without paying its attached cost. So effectively, I could move this equipment to them for free. There was a cycle of uncommon elementals with Invoke, just that, and a cycle of uncommon creatures with Kinship. Now, two cards were reprinted in this set, including Elvish Warriors, and there was one functional reprint, Fencer Click for Wayward Soul. So the four pre-constructed decks, a white-blue deck called Battalion, a blue-black called Going Rogue, a white-black-green called Shamanism, and a red-green called Warrior's Code. Now let's talk about some of the cards from this set. There was Bitter Blossom. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life, and you put a 1-1 one, one black fairy robe token into Battlefield. So each turn you kept losing life, but you kept getting fairies. Lots of them. Mutavolt was a land that you could tap for one colorless mana, or for paying one colorless mana, this land would become a 2-2 two, two creature with all creature types until end of turn that still counted as a land. So you could turn this land into effectively a changeling? Spite Bellows is a 6-1 that when it leaves the battlefield, it does 6 damage to target creature. It has an invoke cost of 1 cutlass and 2 red. So for effectively 3 mana, you can do 6 damage to a creature. Or you could just put out the 6-1 and have a battle for a while. Revile Lark was another elemental that had flying. This one, when it leaves the battlefield, you may return two target creatures with a power of two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. You resurrect two low power creatures. And this one also has an invoke cost of five colorless, one white. So you can evoke it and get rid of it to quickly get this effect. Now there are three cards I'm gonna talk about in a second that the thing about them is People think of them as functional reprints, when the fact is, they're not. Each of them is a unique card to this set, but they're similar to other cards. Disperse, return a non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Simple as that. Negate, counter, target, non-creature spell. These two seem like other blue spells that should exist. The last one though, Picky Bogart, costs you one black mana for a 1-1 one, one fear creature. The reason why people think this is a functional reprint is that the Urza's block had a 1-1 one, one fear creature for a black and a colorless. So this is a better one, but people link the two of these together. Bold Weir Heavyweights is an 8-8 trample for really cheap, but each opponent may search their library for a creature card, put it into the battlefield, and then shuffle their library afterwards. So if you're willing to give all your opponents a creature, you get something big. Bold Weir Intimidator says that cowards can't block warriors. For one red, target creature becomes a coward until end of turn. And for two colors and a red, target creature becomes a warrior until end of turn. So for a little bit of mana, either you're playing a warrior deck, or you can make things into warrior, you can make your stuff unblockable. At least two creatures you don't want blocking you. Sends Tactician. For white and tapping it, put a plus one, plus one counter on target soldier. Each creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it can block an additional creature each combat. So effectively, you can make your creatures block two creatures, at least your soldiers. Chameleon Colossus is a 4-4 changeling that has protection from black, and for two colors, two green, it gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X has its power. You can keep paying it, and each time, you double its power and toughness. Well, by its power. So if you have things that increase its power to begin with, it's getting a bonus, but you double its power each time and give a bonus to your toughness also. So it's pretty good. Cream of the crop. When a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you look at the top X cards of your library, where X is the power of that creature. You put one of those cards, you put one of those cards back on top of your library and put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So each time you play a creature, you can look at those cards and figure out, hey, what do I want out of here? I might only get one of those cards, but I can keep getting the best of all those cards. The creep of the crop. Daily Regime. It's an enchantment for white and a colorless. Put a plus one, plus one on counter on the creature that Daily Regime is enchanting. So as long as you have mana, you can keep putting plus one, plus one counters on this creature has plenty of combos to go along with that. Kingsbale Cavalier. 
Night creatures you control have double strike. If you're playing a knight deck, this is a really good one for it. Door to Destinies. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. Every time you cast a spell of that type, you put a counter on Door to Destinies. Creatures of that type get plus one, plus one for each counter on it. So the more spells of that type you play, the bigger all your creatures get. Earwig Squad. It has a prowl cost of two colors and a black. If you paid its prowl cost and put this creature into play, you can look through target opponent's library and exile three cards from it. Fertilid. It comes into play with two plus one plus one counters on it. And then for a colorless and a green, you can remove a plus one plus one counter from it. To search your library for a basic land card, put it into play. Shuffle your library afterwards. So I get this creature, I can change it into lands. I love Fertilid. I have a green black graveyard resurrection where he comes back and keeps giving me lands. Feud Killer's Verdict. You gain 10 life. If you have more life than an opponent, you may put a 5-5 giant warrior token into the battlefield. You gain a bunch of life, and more than likely, get a big token. Guilt Leaf Druid. Whenever you play a Druid spell, you may draw a card. Tap 7 Druids you control. Gain control of all lands target opponent controls. You steal all the lands from an opponent. I have this in my elf deck where a lot of my elves are druids. I don't usually get to use it, but it's stealing lands in a druid deck. Bam. Really good. Idyllic Tutor. Search your library for an enchantment card, put it into your hand, shuffle your library afterwards. Simple as that. Enchantment searching. Of course, you do have to reveal it, but still. Lightning Crafter. Champion a goblin or shaman. So it was another champion effect from the, what we talked about in the previous Lorwyn plot set. But this one, then, once you've championed it, tap, deal three damage, target, creature, or player. It effectively does lightning bolt each turn by tapping it. Notorious Throng, with a prowl cost of five colorless, one blue. When you cast it, you put X11 black fairy robe tokens into play, where... X is the amount of damage that was dealt to opponents this turn. If you prowled, take an extra turn after this one. This is a really good one because you get a bunch of tokens, get another turn. Orchard Warden. Whenever another tree folk comes into play, you gain life equal to its toughness. Pretty simple one there. Reach of Branches. Put a 2-5 tree folk shaman token into the battlefield. When a forest comes to play under your control, if Reach of Branches in your graveyard, you may return it to your hand. You cast it, get a Tree Folk, play a Forest, get it back, you can keep getting Tree Folk. Riss the Exiled. Here's Riss, which we were talking about earlier. When he attacks, you gain one life for each elf you control, and for one black, you can sacrifice an elf to regenerate Riss. Scape Shift. When you play it, you may sacrifice any number of lands. For each land you sacrifice, basically X, you may search for that many lands in your library and put them into play tapped. Get rid of a bunch of lands, replace them with a bunch of lands. Single Tracer, a colorless of blue. Tap two untapped wizards you control, copy target instant sorcery. You can choose new targets for that copy. Simple as that. It's a way that you can use wizards to copy instant sorceries, which is always good. Stoneweaver, giant. It's vigilance. And for a colorless and a white, you may tap it. Search your library for an equipment card put it into play attached to target creature you control. So not only can it search for any equipment, it attaches it to a creature as soon as it comes to play. Bam! A real good one right there. Because you could do this instant speed, meaning I could search and equip an, or in, in, in equi search and equip an equipment during combat or something like that, where a situation where instant equipment might be helpful. Storybook Schoolmaster. When it becomes tapped, you put a 1-1 one, one blue Merfolk Wizard token into play. So if you have ways of tapping, untapping it, things like that, it is itself can do combo with other stuff from the Merfolks and Wizards, well, you get more tokens. Supreme Exemplar. Champion Elemental. It is a 10-10 flying elemental. Simple, big, mean. Torian Mauler. It is a changeling. When an opponent casts a spell, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on Torian Mauler. 
That means the more spells your opponent slash opponents cast, the bigger it gets. Verdillion Click is a flying flash. When you play it, you may look at target opponent's hand and choose a card from it. If you do choose a card, they reveal that card, put it on the bottom of their library, and then draw a card. This is a good way that if an opponent's about to cast something or play something, you can actually flash this in and remove something from their hand, quickly and efficiently. Bottom of their graveyard library. I mean, they get another card in replace of it, but what they really wanted, it's gone. And finally, Weirding Shaman. For three colors and a black, you can sacrifice a goblin to put two 1-1 one, one black goblin rogue creature tokens onto the battlefield. Get rid of one goblin for two. But that's it for today. So, we talked about the second set in Loreman block, Morning Tide. Morning Tide is interesting because of that focus on class rather than race. We have, of course, had this huge racial focus in Lorwyn, and in Morning Tide, we had this other shift in the way that they looked at tribes, which harkens back a little bit to that earlier block, the Onslaught block, where we did see a mixture of classes and races when it came to the tribalism they had, but it expanded on all tribalism once again, increasing some abilities and continuing those themes quite well, leading us into the next block, which we're going to be talking about, and of course the next set, Shadowmoor, which is a complete change to this one, but still set in the same world, but yet not. An interesting thing that we'll be talking about in the sets to come. But I hope you're having a great day. And of course, until the next time, I'll bid you farewell.